Good morning, saints. I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Psalm 63. Psalm 63 will be our text this morning. And as I always do, I invite you to hear and receive the inspired and authoritative word of the triune God. He is the only God, and this is his word. A psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword, they shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God, all who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of the liars will be stopped. Let's pray. Lord God, we're asking this morning that you would speak to us through the preaching of your word such that we might realign, refocus, and live with you at the center of our lives. Lord, there are trials and challenges that each of us face, and we need you. We need encouragement from you. We need peace and comfort and joy not just from you, but in you. So that's what we're asking for, that you would meet us by your spirit through the proclamation of your word and minister to us for your glory's sake, for our good, and for the benefit of those under our influence. We ask these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hard times. Difficult times, trying times. If you're not in the midst of a challenging time, then just wait, because you're going to be. The Lord Jesus Christ told his disciples before he departed from them, in this world you will have trouble. In this world you will have tribulation. Somebody say amen, Jesus. In other words, shortly before he goes to the cross, Jesus looks his disciples in their eyes and he assures them, not that everything is going to be honky-dory, but he assures them that life as one of Jesus' disciples is not immediate prosperity and peace. Rather, he assures them that they're going to have Difficulty. A prosperity gospel, a name it and claim it gospel, a material blessing kind of gospel is the doctrine of demons. Jesus says that life in this world comes with trial and tribulation, but that's not all he said, is it? Jesus said in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. 
for I have overcome the world. The one who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. The one who said, I am the life and the resurrection. The one who said, my kingdom is not of this world, again looks his disciples in their eyes, and he says, take heart. Be encouraged. Lift up your drooping heads. Make short your long faces, because I have overcome the world. You are, yes, in the world, saint, but not of the world. The people of God in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and in the world ever since then, have been a people who have experienced difficult times. Just because you're on God's team, if you will, doesn't mean everything always goes smoothly. Now, as I was preparing this sermon, I paused to consider some of the difficulties that you, the saints of Redeemed South Bay, are in the midst of. We have people in our midst with serious health problems. We have people in our midst with life-threatening disease. We have people in our midst with serious sin struggles. We have people in our midst with evildoers threatening their livelihood simply because they want to abide by the Word of God. We have people in our midst who are reviled and ridiculed in their workplaces because of their biblical convictions. We have people, quite frankly, in our midst who are overwhelmed by their current circumstances of life. And these are just some of the situations that I am personally aware of. Imagine the difficulties that I have not mentioned and the difficulties that I am unaware of. Beloved, we find and we will find ourselves in difficult times. Sometimes our difficulties are due to our own sin. Sometimes our difficulties are due to the sin of others. And sometimes our difficulties are the result of living in a fallen world. But take heart. Jesus has overcome our sin and he has overcome this world. What do we do? What do we do? Ultimately, the truth of God's word, the Bible, the scriptures must minister to us in the midst of our difficulties. And Psalm 63 is an absolutely glorious text for us to consider so that the spirit of God might minister to us through his word. The superscription of our text gives us the, the general situation when David penned this psalm. It says, a psalm of David's. So we know King David wrote it, and then we hear these words, when he was in the wilderness of Judah. And perhaps we might immediately think of David being in the wilderness when he was fleeing from King Saul. However, in verse 11 of our text, we have a little detail that further clarifies the particular instance of David in the wilderness. David refers to himself as the king in verse 11. This means that Psalm 63 was not written while David was fleeing from King Saul. Rather, Psalm 63 was written at a time when David had already assumed the throne and yet was in the wilderness. So let's identify the context of when David penned this psalm. And what I want to do is I want to look at what I'm going to call the preceding context of the psalm. Yes, this is still all introduction. The preceding context of the psalm, I, I want to look at the, the years before or the years leading up to Psalm 63. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, David commits adultery with Bath, Bathsheba and he conspires to have her husband Uriah killed in battle. This is going to be a turning point for David. If you read the story of David up to this point, we could sum it up with one word, victorious. 
But after his sin with Bathsheba, yes, he repents. Yes, he comes back to God. Yes, he uh, still desires to follow after God. But his life gets difficult. Sometimes our sin introduces difficulties in our lives. And in 2 Samuel chapter 12, David confesses the sin of adultery. And David's son, whom Bathsheba conceived from David, died, died shortly after his birth as a result of David's sin. Then we get to 2 Samuel 13, and David's son, son Amnon rapes David's daughter Tamar. And as a result, David's other son, Absalom, murders his brother Amnon and then flees from Jerusalem. In 2 Samuel 14, Absalom returns to Jerusalem. And in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 through 12, after Absalom returned to Jerusalem, he got himself a chariot and horses and 50 men to run before him. In other words, Absalom was preparing for battle, and it wasn't with a foreign nation. After that, Absalom began conspiring against his father David by slowly and tactfully and carefully telling the people of Israel that he would be a better, a better king than his father David, such that Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And then Absalom set himself up as a rival king in Hebron. That's David's life leading up to the writing of Psalm 63. But now let's consider the immediate context of Psalm 63, or the particular situation that Psalm 63 arises out of. If you haven't done so already, please turn with me to 2 Samuel. I'm going to pick up in 2 Samuel, chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15, beginning at verse 13. This is after Absalom's conspiracy and after he begins to seal the hearts of the men of Israel. 2 Samuel 15, 13 begins, And a messenger came to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel have gone ab after Absalom. Then David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly, and bring down ruin on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. David gets word of what his son has done, and David decides to flee, knowing that his son is preparing for war against none other than him. Look down at verse 23 of 2 Samuel 15. As the people are going out, we hear this, And all the land wept aloud as all the people passed by, and the king crossed the brook Kidron. And all the people passed on toward the wilderness. And Abiathar came up, and behold, Zadok came also with the Levites, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God until the people had all passed out of the city. Then the king said to Zadok, Carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let me see both it and his dwelling place. But if he says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am. Let him do to me what seems good to him. At this point, David seems uncertain about the outcome of his situation. He's trusting in the Lord. He's allowing his life to be handled by the Lord. He says, you leave the Ark of the Covenant back in Jerusalem in its rightful place, in the place that God desires it to be. I'm going to flee, and I don't know what's going to come of me. Verse 29 of 2 Samuel 15. So Zadok and Abiathar carried the ark of God back to Jerusalem, and they remained there. But David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, barefoot, 
and with his head covered, and all the people who were with him covered their heads, and they went up weeping as they went. It's a dramatic scene. David's fearful of his life. He has a few that are faithful who are coming along with him, but overall the statement is that Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. It's as if David can sense, he can feel that he is going to lose the kingdom because of his son's rebellion. One last text before we get into our psalm, 2 Samuel 16, beginning at verse 5. They're in the wilderness, and this is what they encounter. When King David came to Bahurim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul that would be King Saul, whose name was Shammai, the son of Gera. And as he came, he cursed continually. And he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right and on his left. And Shammai said, as he cursed, get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son, Absalom. See, your evil is on you for you are a man of blood. Then Abashai, the son of Zariah said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and take off his head. But the king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah? If he is cursing because the Lord has said to him, Curse David, who then shall say, Why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my, son, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjaminite leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me, and the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. So David and his men went on the road, while Shammai went along on the, hit, on the hillside opposite him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and flung dust." And the king and all the people who were with him arrived weary at the Jordan. And there he refreshed himself. David's in a bad spot. His circumstances are difficult. He is weary. He is tired. And he is uncertain of what's going to happen. Certainly, as they arrived at the Jordan... David would have refreshed himself with water, but I also suggest that this is probably the instance wherein he also refreshed himself in the Lord, which resulted in the writing of Psalm 63, because shortly after, the tide starts to turn for David. Saints, David was in an overwhelmingly difficult situation, and he was weary. He needed to be refreshed in the Lord. So let me ask you a few questions as we move toward Psalm 63. Do you find yourself this morning in an overwhelmingly difficult situation? Or maybe you're not overwhelmed by your situation. Maybe you're simply weary. Are you weary this morning? Or maybe you're just lethargic. Eh, God's good, life's good, not really zealous for him, not really seeking him, but everything's fine. Do you need to be refreshed in the Lord this morning? Do you need to refocus and live with God at the center of your life? If your answer is yes to any one of these questions, then Psalm 63 is for you. If your answer is no to all of these questions, then it's my prayer that you might hear the voice of God through the preaching of his word this morning and call upon him. The main idea of Psalm 63 is simple. Psalm 63 presents three necessary keys for you to be a God-centered stranger in this world, especially in the worst of times. Let me share what I mean by that. 
When we talk about being God-centered, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking simply about this, that, that God is the source and the purpose of our lives. That I make it my aim to please him in whatever I say, whatever I think, whatever I do. I'm after pleasing God. That's being God-centered. And we're talking about being a stranger. We need to remember this, saints. The Bible identifies those who are God's people as strangers, as sojourners, and as aliens. Meaning this world is not our home, amen? We're God-centered strangers. We live for him while we're on this earth, knowing that this earth is not our home. How many of you know that the most difficult time to be a God-centered stranger in this world is when times have gotten difficult for you. Therefore, this psalm presents three necessary keys for you to be a God-centered stranger in this world. You can see there in the outline before you, the first thing I do is I give you the key. But then I invite you to ask yourself a question as we consider God's word afresh. And then a simple command. The keys are simple. You need to desire God you need to have a satisfaction in God. You need to have a trust of God. But the hard work that you need to do and that you need to ask the Lord help with is simply honestly answering, are you desiring God? Will you be satisfied? I, I pray that you hear me. Will you be satisfied in God? And do you trust God? If not, then simple. This is what I love about God's word. He tells us what we need, and then he tells us to do it, and he empowers us by his spirit to do so. Desire God, saints. Be satisfied in God, saints. Trust God, saints. So let's begin with key number one, a desire for God. Are you seeking or are you desiring God? And then desire God. Verses one through four. David writes, O oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. Verse 1, David in his time of trial does two things. First, he acknowledges God. He calls upon God. He simply begins by saying, oh, God. There is so much power in rightly interpreting your situation. And if you rightly interpret interpret your situation, then it always leads to at least one outcome, and that outcome is an acknowledgement of God. This is where we begin. Oh, God. Oh, God. There are times when we want to do what? I talk to you guys. I know these things. Sometimes we want to vent. We want to lay out all of our problems and, and share with those who are closest to us and there is not necessarily anything wrong with processing out loud. That's not the argument I'm making. However, when we ramble about all of our pro problems prior to acknowledging God, then it reveals that our initial desire is likely something other than God. Yet, when we begin with a heartfelt, oh God, it indicates that our desire is for God himself. So first, David acknowledges God. And look at what David does next. He declares the most important truth in the midst of any difficulty. He says, you are my God. David makes it personal. It's not something out there, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a God out there. There are a lot of people who pray in time of need. You know that? Any crisis that we go through, you look on social media or look in the headlines and you're going to see people asking for help, asking for prayer. A lot of people pray in the heat of the moment. They might say something like, God, if you're real 
Or God, if you're out there, then please help me. I often think of it's a wonderful life. But David has a personal relationship with the one true God, and he reminds himself of it. He preaches to himself in the midst of his difficulty. He says, oh, God, you are my God. Do you know how centering and how humbling it is to walk in this truth? The God who created everyone, the the one who is sovereign, absolutely sovereign over all, the one who knows all things, the one who has power and authority to do as he pleases, relates to wretched sinners in such a way that we can call him my God. It's unbelievable. And we take it for granted. I take it for granted. This God relates to us so much so that God the Son would assume a human nature to live in the stead of his people that he would die in the stead of his people, that he would be raised on behalf of his people so that we, his people, would be justified and made children of God and be indwelt by the Spirit. Unworthy. Unworthy. Unworthy, saints. But he is my God. And he is your God by grace through faith in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, in the midst of this difficulty, begin like David did. Oh God, you are my God. Now, when we acknowledge God and remind ourselves that he is our God, there's a result. We want God. David says, earnestly I seek you. Oh God, my God, I'm in a dire situation and there's none besides you. Therefore, I search for you. Therefore, I'm on the lookout for you. Therefore, I need you and I want you, God. And then David gives an illustration to convey the strength of his desire for God. He says, my thirst, my soul thirsts for you and my flesh faints for you as if I was in the harsh dry land and there is no water. In other words, the entirety of David's being longs for God like a dehydrated man longs for water in the desert. Remember back in 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14, we read, And the king and all the people who were with him arrived weary at the Jordan, that is the Jordan River, and there he refreshed himself. It is possible, and I would argue probable, that David, arriving at the waters of the Jordan after a trek in the wilderness, was on his mind as he penned this psalm. Can you recall a time in your life when you were the thirstiest you've ever been? For me, it was an afternoon, two-a-day practice at football camp in Finley, Ohio. We would practice for two hours in the morning We would have a film session and then lunch, and then we would go out and practice again in the afternoon. And if we had a garbage practice, we would run a lot after those two practices. Often the field temperature would reach over 100 degrees. And there was one afternoon where I was so dehydrated that I stopped sweating. That's a really dangerous position to be in especially when it's 100 and you have football pads on. It's a bad spot to be in. But I was fighting for a starting position on the team. I was a big, tough guy. I had to push through no matter what the cost, right? And so I didn't say a word. I didn't really know what was going on. I remember feeling dizzy. I remember feeling dazed. But we were in one-on-one pass protection. That's when one offensive lineman, that would have been me, goes up against one defensive lineman to see who can get to the quarterback or who would protect the quarterback. And I'm out of it. I mean, I'm staggering. I'm, it's, it's ugly. I'm getting beat time after time after time. And I'm getting just reamed. My coach was, yo, what's wrong with you, Kaufman? He's laying into me. But luckily, 
the strength and conditioning coach noticed that I had stopped sweating. He pulled me aside. He touches my arms. He's like, coach, he's dehydrated. He's out of it. Look at his eyes. And so the strength and conditioning coach pulled me from the practice. I remember so vividly that in that moment, there was nothing, nothing more that I wanted than water. You could have offered me $10 million, I kid you not, I would have taken a glass of water. And I didn't want to just drink water, I wanted to be in the water also. We had these ice tubs that we would sit in and cool down in, and I wanted to be in that water, drinking water, and that's exactly what I did. Exactly what I did when I got pulled from practice. David presents a similar picture as it relates to God. An overwhelming, an overwhelming, intense desire for God. When times are at their worst, what is your greatest desire? When times are at their worst, what is your greatest desire? If it's simply to get out of the bad time. I think we're missing the mark, saints. Oftentimes, God puts us in really difficult positions such that we might long for him afresh. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, David recalls how he regularly worshiped God and satisfied his desire for God. He says, so or thus I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Remember that David had brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. He worshiped before the Lord in the sanctuary of the tabernacle, and he had experienced the power and the glory of the Lord. And just as David had worshiped in happier days, the same intense desire remains only This time, David's not in Jerusalem. And David, remember, had commanded that the Ark of the Covenant be left in Jerusalem as he fled from Jerusalem. As David remembers gazing upon the Lord, if you will, in the place where the Lord desired to be worshipped, one gets the sense that he longed to do so again. And in verse 11, when David says, But the king shall rejoice in God, there is an allusion to David worshiping in the sanctuary of the tabernacle again. We understand that, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ would later say in John chapter 4, verse 23, regarding the the necessity or the lack thereof to have centralized worship in Jerusalem. This is what Jesus said, but the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. He was discussing with the Samaritan woman, are we supposed to worship in Samaria or are we supposed to worship in Jerusalem? And he says, no, there's a time coming when God desires all people everywhere to simply worship him in spirit and truth. And so we know that as New Testament believers in the church era, we do not have one centralized location to worship God. But put yourself in David's position. If you wanted to worship the Lord... You go to the tabernacle. For the Old Testament saints, the tabernacle and then later the temple was the regular and central location to worship God and behold his glory. And David wants to do so again. Why? Why did David desire God? Why did David long to worship God back in Jerusalem? Verse 3. Listen to these words. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. On one hand, David desired God because the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. Yet on the other hand, because the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life, David declares that his lips would praise the Lord. We have a a cyclical nature in our relationship with the Lord, don't we? God is who he is. And he reveals himself to his people such that his people desire him, but it doesn't stop there. Once we have tasted 
and seeing that the Lord is good, the natural response is praise, and that cycle increases and intensifies as we walk with God faithfully. The question that we must ask ourselves is this, do we believe that the Lord's steadfast love is better than life? It's really, I, we know these things. We've been in church, some of us, for years. It's really easy to say these things. It's really easy to show up and sing the songs and, yeah, that was good, but I'm on to my life. But here David says, Lord, your steadfast love is better than my life. I want to answer the question, if we believe that the Lord's steadfast love is better than life, we have to ask ourselves another question. What is the steadfast love of the Lord? The ESV translates the famous Hebrew word kesed as steadfast love, and depending on what translation you have, you'll see various translations, loving kindness, faithfulness, loyalty. The term kesed is a word that is used throughout the Bible in various ways, but often to refer to God's relationship with his people. The idea is that God enters into covenant relationship with his people and that he is faithful or loyal to his covenant and the people therein. So to say that the Lord's steadfast love is better than life is to say that God's covenant loyalty, his graciousness, his goodness, his faithfulness as he relates to his people is better than the gift of life and all that life entails. I was talking with someone recently and I told him, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to be with the Lord. And I think that he thought I was suicidal. I'm not suicidal. I love my life, my wife, and my kids, and our church, and all the abundant blessings that the Lord has bestowed upon me are absolutely great. Your eyes are looking at a very blessed man. But I'll tell you this. To live is Christ, to die is gain. I believe that with every fiber of my being. I'm ready to be with the Lord because the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. So do you truly believe that the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life? Are you able to say with fullness of heart, your steadfast love is better than life, O Lord? Beloved, when we are in our right minds, this statement is a no-brainer. We've all experienced these moments. Yep, yeah, it is. God is life. And from him, and through him, and to him, are all things. May we remember this reality. In the worst of times, saints, that the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. And when our hearts are in that position, then there's a necessary outcome. Look at verse 4. So I'll bless you as long as I live. In your name, I'll lift up my hands. Because the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life, then we spend our lives blessing the Lord and lifting our hands unto him. Remember David's situation. David's son Absalom is after his life, and David is not sure at this point if he's going to live or die. He's not sure how much time he has left, but he is certain of one thing. However long he lives, as a stranger in this world, he will bless the Lord. By the way, this is a little pastoral aside. If you're one of those people who have a problem with people who are slightly animated in their praise of God, then I encourage you to wrestle with this text. Many people have many opinions about how we should or should not position our bodies in corporate worship. 
Lifting one's hands during a song of worship is not necessarily, I want us to understand this rightly, is not necessarily an authentic expression of worship. Anyone can come in here and put on a show. However, there are times when one's body may sincerely express what is going on in one's heart. Certainly, we don't want to be a distraction to others. I don't think we have that going on here at all. We don't want to be a distraction to others as we come together for corporate worship. We have one screen, too, sometimes when someone's really big and I'm like trying to look through them and read the words. So we, we need to be considerate of one another. I, I understand that. But we also have to have a place in our theology that allows us to worship the Lord with the entirety of our being. It needs to be orderly. It needs to be in control. We're not talking about craziness. But we need to have a place in our theology for someone to lift their hands unto the Lord to express the fullness of what's going on in their heart. Pastoral side is done. Beloved, the first necessary key for you to be a God-centered stranger in this world, especially in the worst of times, is the desire for God. Are you desiring God? Desire God. This brings us to key number two. A satisfaction in God. Will you be satisfied in God? Be satisfied in God. Verses 5 through 8 read, My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadows of your wing I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. Verse 5 We see David indicating that a soul satisfied in God is expressed by a mouthful of praise. A soul satisfied in God is expressed by a mouthful of praise, and he illustrates a satisfied soul as a belly filled with fat and rich food. There's a show that I like. I'm not endorsing it. Your discretion be advised. There is a show called Alone where wilderness experts go out into a desolate place to live off the land. And many of these contestants lose 50 pounds or more over the course of a couple months as they are unable to procure procure the resources necessary to keep up their weight. But it's funny. When these contestants kill a small bird or they catch a small fish, the satisfaction is undeniable. They are so excited to have a filet of fish with no seasoning over an open fire. I mean, they're just delighted. It's a marvel to watch how satisfied they are. I've never spent months in the wilderness But I did go on a 40-day fast from solid food during Lent back in 2010. And I would have coffee, I would have broth, and I'd have a cup of juice every day. And at the end of those 40 days, there was nothing that I wanted more than to eat some fatty food. And I did just that. It was midnight at Denny's. (laughs) There's no other place to open at that time. And I went there with the friend who I did this fast with, and I don't remember all that I ordered. We ordered way more than we could eat. I do remember nachos was on that order. Nevertheless, I do remember very clearly that that cheap Denny's, what I would now say garbage food, was quite possibly the best food that I have ever had in my life. My body was craving fatty foods, and if there's one thing that Denny delivers on, it's fatty food. (laughs) Beloved, how much more? How much more is our soul satisfied when it receives what it craves? If we desire God, then we are satisfied in him. The believer's soul craves for God. Amen? However, 
Our satisfaction is not automatic. You have to get this. Our satisfaction is not automatic, is it? You don't wake up in the morning, each and every morning, thinking to yourself or living, man, life is great. I am centered on God right now. I am completely satisfied. No, God provides means. And look at what David tells us in verse 6. He says, when. He says, when. My soul will be satisfied when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. The word when is so important. In other words, satisfaction of the soul is a byproduct. Satisfaction of the soul is a byproduct. Your soul's satisfaction is a byproduct of remembering God and meditating on God. Man, my life's really tough right now. I have no joy in the Lord. Uh, lethargic, I'm not happy, I'm upset, I'm frustrated. You know what my first question is? When someone comes to me with something like that, is there a serious sin that you need to confess to me? That's the first question. Second question is this. What's your walk with the Lord like? How much time are you spending alone with God? The soul satisfaction is a byproduct of remembering and meditating on God. We get the picture that David was restless and sleepless. He was in the wilderness contemplating the situation with his son, and he identifies here, I remember you, what, upon my bed. I meditate upon you, where? In the watches of the night. He's up all night. He's sleepless and he's restless. The question for us is what do you do when you're restless? What do you do when you're unable to sleep at night? Restlessness and sleeplessness do not necessarily mean that you are not satisfied in God. We can find ourselves in many situations where we're genuinely concerned. We have a difficulty resting or sleeping. However, what you do or don't do when you are restless and when you are sleepless can be strong indicators of what you're seeking satisfaction in. What do you remember? What do you meditate on in the worst of times? Do you consider and dwell upon how things used to be? Do you think about past relationships? Do you think about shoulda, woulda, coulda, and then my life would be this? Do you binge on Netflix? Are you on social media all night? Are you playing video games? Food, mind-altering substance, music, explicit images, online shopping, the list could go on and on and on and on. Beloved, none of these things satisfy the soul and bring joy. None of them. Your soul, Christian, will be satisfied and your mouths will praise with joyful lips when and only when you remember God upon your bed and when you meditate on God in the watches of the night. Look what David says in verse 7. He continues. He gives us a reason why. Why will his soul be satisfied when he remembers the Lord on his bed and when he meditates on the Lord in the watches of the night? He comes to this conclusion for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. We are satisfied in God when we remember and meditate on him because we recall his faithfulness, his undeserved faithfulness to us. This is so helpful. When we think about the things that the Lord has done in our lives to bring himself glory and to help us, I oftentimes, I oftentimes think of, Lord, I was headed to destruction and you snatched me out of the miry clay. 
When I want to be down and when I want to have a pity party and when I'm going to play the world's smallest violin, oh, my life, blah, blah, blah. No, I was doomed to hell. And the Lord said, you're mine. And he turned me. And he enabled me. He gave me new affections and new desires. For he has been my help. David says, you and you alone have been my help. Oh God, I am still here. I am still kicking because you have helped me. When I'm alone, when I'm afraid, when I'm uncertain, when I'm overwhelmed, I turn to God who is my ever-present help and my refuge in a time of need. Notice what David doesn't do. David doesn't recall all of his achievements. Look at the many things I did. I slayed Goliath. I've killed tens of thousands. Every place I've been, I've been victorious. That's not what he does. He recalls God's faithfulness. And he gives the picture of a mother bird covering her brood when he says, in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. Picture with me, if you will, a baby bird in a nest. Puny little necks, no feathers on them at all, can't even flap a wing. They are utterly helpless. They cannot feed themselves. They cannot fend for themselves. They can't even fly away from danger. This is a picture of you and I. However, as a mother bird covers her babies to warm them, to shield them from the sun, and to protect them, so God covers his own to help and defend them. And in that position, <laughs> in that position, saints, oh, how we can sing for joy regardless of our circumstances. It's exactly what David says. For you've been my help, and in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. David is utterly dependent on God, who is his satisfaction. So he says in verse 8, My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. In this one verse, we get the response of one who knows that God alone will be his satisfaction. On one hand, David says, my soul, my inner being, my inner man, it clings to you, it latches onto you, oh God. That's his only option. Yet on the other hand, David's soul only clings to God because God's right hand holds on to and upholds David. This verse presents the concept of perseverance and preservation. God's people, we, God's people, persevere in the worst of times because God preserves his people in those times. Again, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And later Jesus told his disciples what? That he would be with them always until the very end of the age. Saint, listen to me. You are not alone in your difficult circumstance. For God upholds his people. Be encouraged. Be satisfied in God, the one who knows all things, the one who is orchestrating all things. Yes, every detail of your life according to his perfect will is the one who holds you so that you can press on. Beloved, the second necessary key for you to be a God-centered stranger in this world, especially in the worst of times, is satisfaction in God. Will you be satisfied in God? Be satisfied. Be satisfied in God. Finally, this brings us to our third key, a trust of God. Do you trust God? Trust God. Look at verses 9 through 11. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Now remember with me, earlier in some of the passages that we read out of 2 Samuel, David was uncertain about the outcome of his situation. 
But now, David seems absolutely certain that his enemies will be destroyed and that he will rejoice in God. In verses 9 through 10, I mean, that's strong language. David pretty much says, hey, those who seek my life, those who seek to kill me, they're going to die in battle and they're going to be food for jackals. That's as, as clear as you can get. That's what's going to happen. The question is, what happened? Why and how did David go from uncertainty to certainty concerning his situation? And as we've worked our way through this psalm, we have seen David's desire for God. We've seen his satisfaction in God. And David has remembered and meditated on God himself. And in verse 7, David declared once again, for you have been my help. Thus, it seems that David has not only remembered who God is, but that he has also remembered what God has promised and how God has been faithful to keep his promises. He's recounting his life. He's recounting his experiences with God. He's, accounting, he's recounting what God has communicated to him through his word. He has remembered the covenant faithfulness of God. And I suggest that David went from uncertainty to certainty because he simply remembered God's word such that his trust in God was renewed. David's circumstances may have caused him to forget God's promises for a short time. But as David quieted his soul before the Lord, the word of the Lord came to David afresh such that David simply took God at his word again. Well, what kind of things might he recount that would have led him from uncertainty to certainty? Well, for example, we could look at 2 Samuel 3, 18. That verse reads in part, For the Lord has promised David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines, but not just the hand of the Philistines, and from the hands of all their enemies. Absalom and those who had followed him had become an enemy of God's people, and the Lord had promised to deliver them by the hand of his servant David. Or we could consider 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 12. That text reads, And David knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom. Why? For the sake of his people, Israel. As David remembered God and meditated on God, he remembered that the Lord had been faithful to exalt him as king for the well-being of his people. But the clincher is this. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is the text that is the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is the text that is referred to as the Davidic covenant. And the Lord is going to make promise after promise with David. We don't have time to work through it all. We'll begin in verse 8. 2 Samuel 7, beginning at verse 8. Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, I have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. These promises indicate that David's going to be prosperous and that after he's lived a long life and dies, he will lie with his fathers and that the Lord himself will establish the offspring of David to take the throne rather than one of his offspring taking it in rebellion against him. 
So he remembers these words from the Lord. Look with me at the same passage in chapter 25 through 29. After the Lord speaks to Samuel, I'm sorry, after, uh, yeah, after the Lord speaks to Samuel, after David hears the contents of the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning at verse 25, this is part of David's response. He says, And now, O Lord God, confirm forever the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, and do as you have spoken and your name will be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is God over Israel, and the house of your servant David will be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have made this revelation to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now, therefore, may it please you to bless the house of your servant so that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord God, have spoken, and with your blessing shall the house of your servant be blessed forever. David remembered God's covenant with him, such that he realized that Absalom's conspiracy against him was incongruent, incompatible with God's word and God's promises to him. Therefore, David came to this conclusion in verse 11. It says, But the king shall rejoice in God, and all who swear by him shall exult, for the mouth of liars will be stopped. Beloved, David recalled the word of God, and his trust in God was renewed such that David's conclusion really wasn't David's conclusion, was it? It was God's conclusion. God is faithful to his promises. If there's one thing you must know and hold on to in difficult circumstances, it's this. That God is absolutely faithful to his promises. Difficult circumstances in the worst of times can tempt us to turn to many things other than God. However, Difficult circumstances in the worst of times can also invite us to remember God's word. To remember God's promises so that our trust in God may be refreshed. In Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4, David says this. He says, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. Listen to this. He said, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me. See that progression? When I'm afraid, he's acknowledging there's times when he's afraid. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you and God whose word I praise. The idea is that he's interacting with God's word. He's, he's reading it. He's remembering it. He's understanding it. And it causes him to praise God and then trust God. He says, in God whose word I praise and God I trust, then what's the outcome? I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? It's exactly what takes place in Psalm 63. He's afraid. He's concerned. When he's afraid, he puts his trust in God. He considers the word of God. And then he says, I shall not be afraid. Saints, trusting God's word, hear this, trusting God's word is trusting God. I don't want to go down too far of a bunny trail, but I'm going to go here for a second. I'm tired of Christians saying phrases such as, well, I know God's word says this, but I don't think God would want me to do that. Well, I I know that the word of God says this, but in my particular situation, you see, I'm so unique and I'm so special that I shouldn't do what God's word says in this situation. That's, That's what we call spiritual warfare. That Satan would want us to doubt the word of God such that we can focus on ourselves and say, well, in my situation, I'm going to go about it this way, even though generally this is how it should be handled according to God's word. No, no, it's this simple. Trusting God is trusting God's word. And trusting God's word is trusting God. For all scripture is breathed out by God. 
All of it. And it's parts and then it's whole. It's breathed out by God. It's as if God himself was speaking. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped, or competent for every good work. So the conclusion to trusting God is simply this, get in the word. Know the word, believe the word, live by the word, and be refreshed as you trust the God of Scripture. The third necessary key for you to be a God-centered stranger in this world, especially in the worst of times, is the trust of God. Are you trusting God? Trust God. We've observed three necessary keys to be God-centered stranger in this world. Do you want to be a God-centered stranger? Is the question. If so, I trust that Psalm 63 will help you, especially in the worst of times when we're tempted to do that which we should not. May the Lord encourage our hearts such that we all might increasingly be God-centered strangers in this world, knowing this one reality, that soon enough, we'll be going home. Father, I pray that you bless your people. I thank you for the opportunity to consider Psalm 63 this morning. I pray that we would desire you, that we would be satisfied in you, and that we would trust you afresh, all by your grace and the power that your spirit provides. Lord, help us to deal rightly with ourselves. Help us to be honest with ourselves about where we stand before you and encourage us. Some of us simply need to turn away from the foolishness that we're a part of, the wasting time, the silliness that consumes our day. And we need to live as God-centered strangers, and we need your help to do that. I pray that you would encourage those in that camp to do just that through Psalm 63. There are others of us, Lord, um, who by your grace are being faithful. I pray that you would keep us faithful. We're imperfect. We know that, Lord, and we realize that we need to always be seeking ways that we could be more faithful to you. Help those of us who are more mature in the faith, more faithful, practically speaking, to never be content in our walk with you, but to always desire you, be satisfied in you, and trust you all the more. Lord, above all else, I pray that you would help us to focus on the person work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would remember you and meditate on you. That's the key, Lord. We are so prone to meditate on ourselves and our circumstances. We're so prone to remember the things that are important to us. But Lord, remind us afresh that you are life, that your steadfast love is better than life, such that you would be our remembrance and you would be our meditation. Glorify your name, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.